Now, let's welcome our morning keynote speaker. I'm pleased to introduce a fellow AIA National Board member, David Zock, who, a futurist, and who is one of the two public directors on the AIA National Board. David has a master's degree in studies of the future from the University of Houston, which make him one of the very few professionally trained futurists on this planet. Then again, he got this futurist degree way back in 1981, so it's all pretty much history at this point. <laughs> Thank you. Hi, welcome to the future. So is the microphone working? OK. All right, so I have approximately an hour in which to explain the future. So I'm going to have to leave out some of the details. We don't have a lot of time. Let's get going. Here's a quick introduction of me. All right, let's move on. <laughs> oh, wait, uh, let me just go back one. And I do want to thank Bryn Marie Lanciati and Vanessa and the whole team. and. I am just, I, I, am, I am amazed, I am in awe of not simply the organization of this, but the publicity too. So I'm, I'm walking with my friends down Broadway yesterday, and I see this kind of publicity. <laughs> that is awesome, thank you. Okay. All right, I want to preface this a little bit, but just helping you understand a little bit about how does a futurist think? And do understand that if you went into the field of architecture, you are a futurist because you're dealing with products and services that are going to last, in some cases, a lifetime. And things you hope that will live beyond you. So you have to be thinking about the future. First thing, be wary of futurists. And always ask, is there a profit motive behind the profit motive? If somebody comes along, regardless of their title, and says, well, in the future, we're going to have this, and you need to buy into it, ask if you buy it, does the money go in their pocket? What is the motivation? Why do we say what we do when we're thinking about the future? Change does not equal progress. And I'm sure that so at some point, you've been told, hey, you have to be open to change. Here's the quick response. What if it's stupid change? Think, stop, and, and progress comes from our ability to choose between change and tradition. Not all change is progress, it's not all forward. And sometimes, if you want to be the radical, particularly in this day of constant change, be the one who stands upon something permanent and be willing to protect things that endure, that have lasting value, which brings up that old does not mean outdated. And the older I get, the more I think that. <laughs> right, Susan? Yeah. So, you know, I have this phone. And it's cool. And for a while, it was futuristic. But it's a 4S. And now the 5 is out. And <laughs> I hope you won't hold it against me that I still have this for now. But you know, the new technology, we think, oh, well, that's, that's the futuristic thing. How many of you have something in your home that comes from the past, that may be from ancestors, particularly people who are no longer here. Question, is that futuristic? Are those things futuristic? And you, Joe, you just kind of half shook your head no. They are futuristic. Anything that has future value is futuristic. So think about what are the things that have future value? And we get into things like historic preservation. And sometimes you want to chain yourself to a building and say, no, damn it, you're not going to take this. Because this has history. Buildings tell stories through time. And if we, if we get rid of it all, we think we can cut down the past. We will be lost. Think implications time three, times three. And what quite often happens is we're seduced by the next implication, the first ooh shiny thing that comes along but is to think, what are the implications of the implications of the implications? Not that you can always know, and it's not to predetermine the future, but at least know what your options are. 
and not just the one that seems most convenient or the, is the prettiest at the first stage out. The notion of citizen architect. This, I think, is one of the most important things, one of the most important roles you will ever have. And it isn't that you are going to have to necessarily run for office, but that you are an engaged citizen who steps forward with your training, your ideas, your perspectives, because I think, as a non-architect, I think the training you have is some of the most essential training for exactly what we need in terms of future leadership. Much is going to be demanded of you. Lead the terms of the debate. What are we talking about? When we have casual conversations, do we, are we just talking about the weather or fashion? Or are we talking about the things that challenge our existence and challenge what the future should be? Because we have all these choices now. And the, finally, it is this notion that your philosophy is more important than your plans. How you think about things, how you come to a conclusion is very, very important. Stuart Brand, uh, Stuart Brand he's a writer, wrote like the Whole Earth Review, things like that. And he said, in terms of all this technology that we're building and developing and bringing forward, he says, we are becoming like gods. So we better get good at it. <laughs> Question, how's that working for us so far? Yeah. Okay, second preface point is to learn to protect your attention. It is the most valuable thing you own. And so you must protect it. That is the first line of defense in terms of it, you being able to be who you are truly potentially able to be. Your, your value follows your attention. As in, you become whatever it is you pay attention to. You become what you love, whether you admit it or not. So play with fads, work with trends, live by principles instead of being seduced by fads, ignorant of trends, and resistance or denial of principles. That's one of the little handout cards I got, so you can take that with you. All right, so let's reinvent tomorrow. We've got all sorts of ideas. Here are two things from my perspective that I think are fascinating. Everything gets to talk. And when I say everything, I mean everything. The chair here is verbose. It has something to say. It's empty. Someone comes in, and it should be able to say, you, over here, me. You spill something on the carpet. The carpet should have the right to speak up and talk to the little electronic vacuum cleaner, the little Roomba, to come over and clean that up. How many of you have ever been fingerprinted? I'm not going to ask why. <laughs> but you probably did the old school thing of putting on the ink, or you put it on a little pad, and it scanned it. Do you know there's technology right now so from 20 feet away, it can read your fingerprints. And not with you holding your hand up, but you just walking by like this. Oh, wow, oh, wow is right. <laughs> Feeling paranoid yet? <laughs> hey, did you know there are diagnostic toilets? <laughs> they pay attention to what you've been doing. And while you're doing it, it's even taking your weight and blood pressure. How many of you are just freaking out right now? <laughs> Contact lenses with built-in digital displays. They've got them at MIT. Good news and bad news about this. The bad news is they're primitive. The resolution is really minor. You know, they're, they're just prototypes. The good news is they're going to be wireless. <laughs> so there are apps that you can get. You have, to, you have to jailbreak your phone, which for some people, that's no big deal. Face recognition, you can hold it up to somebody, and it will pull up, oh, your name, your Facebook profile. There, there was a, there's a great little video demo of it where, where the woman has this guy's image in there, and it pulls up his J-date profile. Social security numbers, criminal records, not that I'm looking at you in particular. But. 3D camera with depth sensors, which means any object can be touch enabled. So we have this notion of, like, this thing has buttons, or your laptop or your screen has interaction. What if you can just wander around like this? How many of you, somewhere along the line, have seen somebody talking, there's no one else there, 
and you don't see the little earpiece, and you just assume that you don't want to be near that person. What if they're doing that and they're doing this, interacting with the physical environment? And then Google Glass, which is the, the development of the augmentation of reality, the overlay of information. So I don't need to have the camera phone. I can just have my glass and I can look and say, oh, hey, Rick, how you doing? And how's so and so? And hey, how's that whatever you just bought last week? Because I can pull up the profile and things like that. And it's called the Internet of Things. So I'm at NCARB this summer. And in NCARB, people marked off their territory. We're not dogs, so we tip the chairs. Do you know that's against fire code? So it's a hazard. So we've got smart dust, little RFIDs that can communicate. That's a human hair, so these are, the, these are powder sized. So normal RFID tag is about an inch square. You need space to put, where could you put stuff this size? Anywhere, yeah. No boundaries in that. So why not put them up there on those things and you tip the chair up and the underwriting for the meeting, for the facility, is not an, not an annual thing, but moment to moment to moment. And so the prices skyrocket until you put it back the way it's supposed to be. Question, how many of you have like a set of tools? Okay. How many of you have ever used a tool in a way that it wasn't intended? <laughs> I would hope so. What if you were not either legally allowed to do that or through liability you wouldn't dare do that? Because we want you to be safe and we don't want any accidents. And what would that do to innovation? What would it do to the mindset that knows how to take something and go, hey, I bet I can make it do this? You know, the old, that old saying about, hey, y'all, hold my beer, watch this, that kind of thing? Well, <laughs> that's the downside of it. The upside of it of, we are such imaginative creatures. And what if we are always watched? And will we boil? And what if we can have 24-7 building inspections? And what if we put those little RFID tags that a building becomes like a Lego set, where it has to go together, otherwise it may, like, you get an email going, nope, did it wrong. Hmm. Yeah, that's weird. So, I had tweeted yesterday for, watch this video, World Builder by Bruce Brandon, he does special effects, he just nominated for an Emmy with his work on Breaking Bad. Is this the future of architecture, or of architects? Because Bruce is a very good friend of mine, and in our conversations about this, this guy is an architect. And what's fascinating is, in this, the only things that are real is Aaron and the Brian, the actors. Everything else was done digitally. And if I can have glasses that can overlay, do I need a built environment, quote unquote, built environment? Where the design goes not simply into buildings or environments, but even into the natural. That's all digital. When they were filming it, he's just sitting in front of a green screen, doing this and doing that. What if there are no sort of physical rules, like you know that annoying thing called gravity in your designs? What if you could pull up a palette like that? Is this seductive? How many of you know people who watch too much television? How many of you, when you're reading a novel, you forget you're reading a novel and you are in that story? Where's this gonna go? This, he did this in 2009. Where's it gonna be in 2019? And how many of you plan on still being alive in 2019? How many are gonna wait and see how the talk comes? Okay, let's 
move on to the next one. Erin uh, McGrain was in the movie uh, Up in the Air. Um, she was the, the girlfriend of, of George Clooney. And in the movie, she turns him down. And so there's this great interview. that She lives in Kansas City. There's this great interview where she's being asked, what's it like to be the only woman in the world to turn down George Clooney? How many saw Avatar? OK. How many felt suicidal afterwards? <laughs> Serious question. You Google Avatar Depression Syndrome, and you will get millions of hits. You see, this was so realistic. And realistic becomes a very different thing when you, can, you don't have those rules. So you can be, instead of you, you can be this tall blue thin thing that lives out in nature, has all sorts of wonderful things around you, and it's awesome. And then the movie ends, and you're like, whoa. And then you come out, and you look at things like Katrina, and you go, well, this world sucks. <laughs> and then you got augmented reality, where right now we just have it on our phones. But we're going to see so much more of it as we start to have these adaptations. Because you know, we're going to need it. Because we're not going to be able to just hold those things in our hands all the time. So they're going to go here. And we're going to be able to perhaps upgrade people. You don't want to look at that person? Well, you know, George Clooney or, or Aaron or somebody would you know, lease their imagery. You would download it to your wearable computer and have it overlay the people you're with. <laughs> yeah. So if you had to choose one, which would you choose? Of those three, which would you choose? The super virtual augmented or this? Or of course, is the choice not real because we're in fact going to have all three? But some are going to be more seductive than others. How many of you have seen this little video? OK. Done by an Israeli design, uh, a team of Israeli design school students. And it's kind of like um, World Builder, except the contact lenses they wear superimpose things over the real world. So the first thing you see is this guy in his apartment. Now, what do you see there? Or rather, what do you not see? Blank environments. So if I can bring and augment all those things, what do I have to have my own stuff for? He's playing a game. So he sees this superimposed over his apartment. And he's like going through this, he's flying through the air. So he's laying on, on his carpet. He got his legs and his arms in the air as if he's flying. And he has to go through these hoops and he gains scores. Then he goes to fix a meal. And preparing the meal becomes a game. So he gets these little chef hats. And at one point he screws up the chopping of the zucchini and he tosses it off, he's upset, and he pulls out another one to start over. <sighs> but this is what he sees when he looks at his walls. At what point do you come and compete directly with graphic designers, virtual designers? He gets a reminder, he has a day tonight, and he has, wants to know if he wants help picking an outfit. And he actually earns points based upon how nice of an outfit he puts on. He meets her in this bar, and almost right away, something goes wrong. So he pulls up an app called Wingman, <laughs> and then pulls up her profile. So it lists her hobbies, you know, her, her in essence, her Facebook profile. So imagine you're with somebody and being able to pull up their profile. Would you like that? Or would that just make you kind of freaked out that someone could do that? But notice, it has a difficulty score. <laughs> and at one point, she realizes he works for the site company. So she like kind of confronts him about this. And he has his game pulls up all these things going, oh, this is what she's pulling up. Because they're both wearing these things. But notice his score has gone up to 350. So they go back to his place. This is what she sees there. 
But then for some reason, she realizes, she goes, wait, what is this? And realizes he has scores up on his wall there. She gets upset. She storms out. And he stops her. He says something that reboots her, her lenses. How much of this is potential? And in, in the notion of when we get to design the world the way we see it, the way we interact with it, where we become entities unto ourselves, worlds unto ourselves, are you frightened? Milton Friedman said the power to do good is also the power to do harm. And if we don't have philosophy, if we don't have something long term to back us up in terms of how we make our decisions, we are in grave danger. Marsh McLuhan said, first we shape our tools, and then our tools shape us. Churchill was famous for saying, first we shape our buildings, and then our buildings shape us. They're coming together. And you have all sorts of choices to make, because this is your realm. These are the things you're going to have to make decisions about, and to be able to speak up and say something is good or something is bad. And being together in those decisions, having those conversations, come on in. <laughs> I'm a futurist, so I knew they were going to be. Yeah. <laughs> There's some, uh, I think, some seats back there, and uh, a few up here. These chairs should be going. Oh. All right, let's move on. Boom. How about 3D printing? I am fascinated with this because I think it's going to radically transform how we work with materials. And as Joe and Susan were talking about, this notion of the craftsperson, that, that, that craftsmanship coming back, which I think we become very passive with so many of our materials. But what if we get to create and design and build? I think it's a fascinating arena to really bring back into and in bring back to a, a sense of equality of the art versus the science of what it is to be an architect. So you know, you've got these 3D printers that can print wrenches that come out of the machine fully assembled and strong enough to use to put together or take apart a car. And there are, um, we now can print with a rubber-like material, various plastics, and a whole array of metals, including titanium. You got this one film, The Man Who Prints Houses, architectural forms or even, you know, something like that. This one is a prototype. You take it to the housing site and you print the house. And the precision that we can do this with now, down to the micron level, meaning millionth of a meter, imagine being able to print a house where you're actually also printing the circuits, the outlets, the light switches, or even potentially the light bulbs or windows that you could see through and open and close those windows. Now we're not there yet. But anytime you hear a forecast and your brain immediately goes, oh, they can't do that. Then as a futurist, you have to stop and go, all right, so what would have to change so that could be possible? And that's where our brains are at because we're getting so good at innovation. But it goes much farther than just like building materials. This little girl has a genetic condition where she doesn't have the strength to lift her own, lift her own, own arms. So they printed her an exoskeleton with these like rubber bands to help her control. And you see here a photograph of one of the first times she hugged her own mother. That's good stuff. There's a car. Most of it was printed. The shoe was printed. The human jawbone. They're printing cartilage at, at, at research hospitals. They've got human organ printers, prototypes, but working with stem cells. They're teaching these things to work. Where's this going to go? And what are the limits? This is a food printer here. How would you use this to help redefine and bring renaissance to the world of architecture? and the world of architects. So just did an article, it's coming out next week in Design Intelligence, aimed at the whole EP crowd, entitled, The Future's Just Not That Into You. And the point is that we're obsessing about the future, and maybe we're doing it wrong. 
And the question is, what if the future is just a big jerk? It's never going to be there for you. It's never going to call. It's not even going to meet you halfway. In effect, the future doesn't even know you exist. But yet, we are prepackaging. You're being sold this prepackaged, very distracting, very seductive notion about what the future is going to be. And you know you're going to be perfect for it. And so you, you, you train and you think about it and you keep thinking that's where you want to be. And what happens is the present quite often gets neglected. The present needs you. Learn to show up fully prepared to be no place else. And that's about attention, of being present in the moment. Very, very powerful thing that we don't know how to do anymore because of squirrel factor. Always being distracted. What are you being distracted from and why are you being distracted? The spoils go to the distractors. There are people who benefit from you constantly having to shift your attention. The question you really need to wrestle with, and we need to do this over drinks, how different might the future be? It might be radically different from anything we've been prepared for, anything we've been thinking of, which is why I love literature. I love stories. And not just simply science fiction, which I love. Daniel Suarez has written three novels that are fascinating and frightening. But yet, I love Jane Austen. She's my favorite author. And it is, you know, it's good to know what the future scenarios are but it's also great to know about the human condition. What doesn't change about us is far more important than what the next change is. You have to ask this question. Will architects be automated? And the basic answer is no, not the good ones. How you define what is a good architect in the next decade is the challenge of this century for this occupation. You are in the time where we get to choose, we get to think, we get to extrapolate. You have tremendous responsibility, tremendous opportunities, and you should be thrilled to be in the midst of this downturn, which is also a falling of boundaries. What can you do that cannot be automated? Is anyone going to pay you to do that? Is it legal for them to pay you to do that? <laughs> what can you finally do that you want to do, that you've been held back from? And then the last one is, what should you finally stop doing? And it is this sense of the 80-20 law, Pareto's law. Just for an example, think about the possibility that 80% of what you do is better done by a machine or by somebody else. You want to be vitally involved in the future and vital to the future? You figure out what this 20% is. The numbers are, are, are vague. It doesn't matter. But just think about what is it is the essence of what makes, what is, what becomes a great architect. I love the line about, you know, there's an app for that. And there's more and more apps for what an architect does and what a doctor does or anybody else. But the question is, do we cross out that and say there's an app for you? Because there's so much automation going on. And what I love, there's this line from Marshall McLuhan where he talks about when a new technology comes in and displaces an old one. The old technology doesn't simply go away as much as it can come back in the form of an art. And again, that is one of the things that I think is, is being neglected as, our, as we rush to the bottom line, we forget the horizon. And so much about art is a forecasting tool about who we are and where we're going. Shall we take the George Costanza test? You see, what I see in the, in the field of architecture and in so many other fields is we become obsessed with numbers and measuring things. And so we measure the measurable, and if we can't measure it, then we go, well, it doesn't, you know, if I can't count it, is it important? Because we can trust numbers. We obsess about them. But there is a reporter by the name of Greg Easterbrook who says, torture numbers, and they will confess to anything. <laughs> and we know that sometimes we fall into that trap. 
and we let it happen because we, it's just easier to go along with what's conveniently assumed to be truth as opposed to what may in fact be true. And this whole obsession with health, safety, welfare, and teaching towards the test. And so many of these courses are about things that are measurable. And so in one of the board conversations, I'm telling tales out of school, Susan, so if you want to plug your ears, go ahead. They were, they were talking about this, and I finally said, look, what you're telling me as an outsider, that what you really care about is being competent and not worrying about being boring. And that's what, that, that is something of what's happening to the field. It is becoming boring. Because you're retreating in the pressure of all these, this, this structure and organization. And you have to ask, what is the purpose of the, of the, of the testing? We all know about George Costanza and his alter ego of Art Vandelay. Because architects are cool, and you really, you know, you are cool. And he figures he could do all sorts of things and get all sorts of things because he's an architect. We get that. What I want to know is, why does so much of the industry want architects to become George Costanzas? And then there's the apologetics test. So I've been suggesting we need an apologetics of design. And when I brought this up in one conversation, somebody said, why do we have to apologize? No, apologetics is the notion of defending the faith, defending what you believe in. And I do not find that, an, uh, that a lot of people in design know how to defend good design. I, for instance, don't think this is design. I think this is the antithesis of design. And I am not an architect. This is, something that, this is something we can argue about, and we should have arguments about it. But lots of times people are held out of the arguments because they say, well, you don't know this. You're not this or that. You don't have a place in the argument. Everybody has a place in the argument. So I want to offer you this marvelous quote that really is not associated with this design, but it's a good one. Prince Philip said, I declare this thing open, whatever it is. <laughs> you know, and, and it says a lot about the public engagement to architecture and what, what, what are we missing? And we have lost a lot by compartmentalizing the world, where if you're not this, you don't have anything to say about this. Well, you know, we're human beings and we're bright and we're engaged and we should, we should have this broader sense of, of the liberal arts in that we are engaged in the whole world. But we're so distracted and we're so professional, we forget that we actually have lives. And then we have what I call the aqua test. And we've got, you know, first we shape our tools and our tools shape us or our, shape our buildings. And so we do BIM. And so buildings look like BIM. And we get buildings that look like technical drawings. And I found this marvelous tweet. Melissa Pierce, she's a filmmaker in Chicago. She said, so many new buildings that look cold and unromantic, boxy without curves, starting to believe the architects had mothers that never loved them. Now there's a great conversation that we can have, <laughs> particularly with drinks. And then we had, uh, uh, last year in September, we had a board meeting, uh, the AA board meeting in Chicago, and then we had an architectural tour. And we went past the Aqua building. And who's the architect? Jing Gang. And, and so the, the tour guide is talking about the building. We're all kind of ooing and aahing. And the architects are ooing and aahing. And the public directors, who are not architects, are going, oh. And she says, I love this building because my little seven-year-old daughter says she's going to run away and go live there. <laughs> and she says, this is great architecture when a little girl would leave her mother for it. <laughs> and, and darn it, it is great architecture. And, I, and one of the things, I love a lot of old architecture. I love whimsy. And I think this argument about getting rid of, of you know, the, the accessories on buildings, the decorations, where we, you know, simplify these things, or they only show up if it's actually some little thing in BIM. Buildings should bring us awe. In Milwaukee, where I live, there's a woman who wrote a book called Building Safaris, and it's for grandparents, specifically for grandparents, to take their grandchildren around the city on a building safari to look at all the little animals and creatures and faces in the building. And think about how a little child, when did you fall in love with architecture? 
and why? And did you fall in love with it because it was a box with squares and little lines on it? Or was there something else there? I think architecture, do you understand, I am not an architect. Someone, when I was on the Wisconsin board, somebody introduced me as an architect wannabe. And somebody who knew me just burst out laughing and said, you know, I've never wanted to be an architect. I don't have the talent for it. But I am in awe of you who have that talent. But do not go gentle into that good night. Rage, rage against the dying of your light. You have it. Light it up, please. So I did a study. I, 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 this year I'll be speaking again at AIS. And it's like absolutely, other than this one, my absolute favorite audience group. And I love the way they're so curious and they're just this engagement. And, fun. and so I did this survey. Um, and I asked the question, if you don't become an architect, because there is that question presented to you, what else might you do? And then I took all those answers and put them into a word cloud. So the more the word shows up, the bigger the word is. Anything jump out at you there? <laughs> and I loved, you know, you run these things until they look good. And I loved having the word love pop up in the middle of one of the letters there. But here's the thing. You, the emerging architects and the young architectural students, you get the fact that the boundaries of architecture are, in fact, artificial. And we put them there for valid reasons until they're no longer valid. And again, we're going to be wrestling with this. And that's what the essence of this repositioning study is, is what is the future of this? They get it. You get it. It is much bigger. It is the world of design. I asked the same question of the board members, who are already all architects. So, the mo one of the most frequent answers is, I already am an architect. What's, <laughs> yeah, Dave, duh. <laughs> but what's the, biggest, what's the biggest word there? Artist. And see what it told me? And you know, this is just my interpretation. It is the one thing about the world of architecture that doesn't get as much attention as it needs. And every architect I know at some level, you know, I love being on the board, and they'll be doodling. And one of the guys uh, uh, last weekend down in Santa Fe, he was doing a map. And it was just ama amazingly elaborate over the, you know, the couple of days. And I said, why are you doing a map? He goes, well, I used to do buildings, and then people would come by and criticize it. <laughs> so he says, I do maps, nobody criticizes. <laughs> but this tells me that this is a very, very important issue of how do we revive and bring vitality back to the artistic sense within the world of architecture. And see, you are on the adventure of a lifetime. And at the beginning of it, and that's exciting as can, as can be. And you need to understand that those of us who have a little bit of what I call silver rather than gray, we're jealous of you. Because it is a marvelous thing to start out life and to start out your careers and to look forward into that unknown, but with a sense of hope. And there's this great line from Leo Tolstoy, all great literature is one of two stories. A man goes on a journey or a stranger comes to town. And you're on this journey. And there are going to be strangers coming in. And you need to be engaging because the wealth is found in connections. Your ability and the training you have is all about making connections. So do you understand that your first assignment hasn't even really started? It is to connect all this world and see what new things we will bring in and what old things we will hold dear and bring with us. At some point during this presentation or during the last year or two, you may feel like you want to retreat because it's overwhelming, and it is overwhelming. And plain and simple, in my occupation, sometimes I sit on my deck with a glass of wine and I just look. I don't want to, I don't want to be overwhelmed with all these trends and stuff. Everyone is freaking out. Every occupation is freaking out. James Thurber said, let us not look back in anger or forward in fear, but around in awareness.
figure out why we're being distracted, and learn to have a sense of presence. Know what your foundations are. Foundations first, then trends, then fads. But know where you stand, because when you have a place to stand, not only can you move the world, but you can move it in a direction. So let's get rid of the word retreat and bring in the Spanish word cadencia, which is in the bull ring. When the bull starts feeling like it's losing, it retreats back to an area that feels safer. And that's what we need to sometimes do. But here's the greatest definition here. A place from which one's strength of character is drawn, a place in which we know exactly who we are, the place from which we speak our deepest beliefs. And I think to a certain extent that is the essence of the repositioning statement, but it is also the essence of the task in front of you, to find that strength, that inner character, so you can come back out and you can fight the good fight. I, I, I think something's very wrong. We've been told there are some things too big to fail. No, that's a lie. They are lying to you when they say that it is too big to fail. Rome fell. We could fall too. And it is obsessed with bigness and putting certain things on financial life support. Maybe small is still beautiful. And so pop-up businesses, which you saw there. And there was an interesting article that I was reading about some sort of, it's like a university or school they want to start on Roosevelt Island. And, and they're talking about just the, 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 the abundance of people with talent here in the city, that their ability to come together and, and be innovative and maybe pick up a book called Where Good Ideas Come From by Stephen Johnson. And he talks about how organizations, big organizations, are getting very good at figuring out how to do innovation. But there are hints within that book on how individuals can also innovate. Small groups, Kickstarter, I think is one of the most marvelous innovations out there because it's an online crowdfunding vehicle for people with good ideas. You put a business plan together, put a video up there, and then people can contribute money. They can buy in. The little Pebble Watch, which is coming out sometime late this fall, little Bluetooth-enabled watch that your phone talks to. You get a call? Call our ID. It's as close to Dick Tracy as we've been. <laughs> I was at a conference on rural e economic development last year, and Lieutenant Governor Brad Little from Idaho said, one of the great things about this country is, here, small ideas are as important as big ideas. That's marvelous. Because that's where all ideas come from. They start small. So look for small things. Look for precious things. Nurture them. Grow them. Vocare, Latin means a calling. Amateur, the ama in amateur means love. And you all, any age you are, never ever lose the amateur perspective. The reason you get up in the morning, the reason you went into architecture almost inevitably was because, because you heard a calling. You had to become an architect. It's what gets you up early in the morning, and it's what keeps you up late at night. Don't lose that, please. Don't. Bunch of Amateurs is a book about, in the United States, through the centuries, things have gotten mucked up. Bureaucracy, regulations, and just the desire for comfort over change. And he said that each time the nation has, in essence, been saved, because the amateurs who didn't know any better found bypasses around it to invent and reinvent the Renaissance notion. I keep hearing that emerging professionals are great at collaboration. You also need to be good at identifying what is your peak skills so you can find and fill in those gaps. Because it is all about finding the bridges, building the bridges, physical and metaphor. Um, we had Eric Kessel come in to talk to the board, and then I've been on some roundtables with him. And this book is kind of fun, and he says it's an architect in search of a practice. And in one of the roundtables at Grassroots last year, this year, he, um, at one point he said, look, I may not be doing what people expected of me, but I am an architect. And then I found out he's not licensed. 
I love the boldness of that. I love him being in our face and saying, screw you. And it's not that I'm agreeing with him. Because it, licensing is necessary, but we must engage in this conversation, in this battle, to define what are the boundaries of the work in the life that we are going to have. We need people like that. It is part of, of renaissance. It is part of life to have these battles rather than passively sit back and go, okay. But don't ever forget that we need the freedom to fail. It is vastly more important than the freedom to succeed. Because when you have the freedom to succeed, the pathways are laid out. And they're easier, but they're also banal. They're boring. And if the pathway is blocked, do you sit down and cry, or do you climb over the seats? Do you have the initiative in you to say, I will get there? And even if you put that block in my way, Actually, I'm glad you put that block in my way because it makes me feel alive. There is the lambent shopping trolley that has come out that's attached to shopping carts, and you scan the food, and it gives you a little smiley face or a frowny face based upon whether it's good nutrition. This is, this is automating Mayor Bloomberg. <laughs> but... At what point do we become so passive? Because, you know, I've heard that the government wants to take over health care. And if they do, they will take over the food industry. They are, that is inevitable. They are inseparable. I want you to go out. If you, are, if, you have, if you have children, might have children, or have ever been a child, <laughs> buy this book, 50 Dangerous Things You Should Let Your Children Do, including super glue your fingers together. Which you know you all have done. <laughs> More than once. <laughs> and one of the pages in that book, play with fire. And here's the thing. We've all, at some point, played with fire. There's something in our human nature that is fascinated by this. If you have never played with fire, you are playing with fire. So don't be afraid of failure and learn to fail small rather than big. And every time I speak to like AAS, I ask the question, how many of you want to change the world, change the future? And almost every hand goes up. And then I ask, based on what? How do you know that your efforts to do good might all coalesce with everybody else's efforts to do good and might result in a world filled with much more harm and sadness. And Mark, the the um, uh, Milton Friedman, the power to do good is also the power to do harm. There's a book called Lost in Transition, it surveyed college age students and asked them about their sense of right and wrong. Very strong sense of right and wrong, a sense of ethics and morality, and one of the questions was, is cheating wrong? Most everybody said, yes, cheating is wrong. And then most of them said, but maybe it's okay for others. Who am I to judge? To the point that about a third of them, when asked, is murder wrong? They all said yes. All of them said murder is wrong. But then they also said, but maybe there are cultures where it's not wrong, and, and who, again, who am I to judge? Really? Huh. So in your efforts to change the world and rebel against the way, the way things are going, try to change, try to be a little closer to little. And David Frost has this marvelous quote. He says, love is staying up all night with a sick child or a healthy adult. <laughs> and it kind of explains an awful lot, doesn't it? And here's a very important thing. He says, or, I say and, that life is not always about pleasure, it's not always about fun. And if you play your, if you play your life right, you will at some point stay up all night with a sick child and another time, a healthy adult. And then at some point, you're also going to stay up all night with a sick adult. And that is what love is. It is not just the fun things. It is being in the core of life and accepting it and embracing it for what it is and not trying to sanitize it completely. We're so afraid of life. We've gotten so comfortable. 
understand that love is so big, so great. I want you to rebel. I want you to rebel against the fads and trends. And understand, fads are not bad things. They're the spice of life. They're great to have in your life. And the trends you either have to work with or work against, but the principles you stand upon and we have this notion of progress, but I don't think you should be allowed to ever use the word progress without explaining it first. Progress towards what? Progress away from what? There's a, a, a writer, G.K. Chesterton, died in 1936, profound in his statements. And he says, the fatal metaphor of progress has always been about leaving things behind us when the real notion of progress is also when we leave things inside of us. Bruce Sterling, science fiction writer, said, maybe we're radically changing the operating system of the human condition. If so, then this would be a really good time to make backups of our civilization. <laughs> what are we losing in our rush forward? I want you to think outside the box. But don't neglect the box, because that's what you're training has been, that it's created a box called architecture. So learn to think inside the box, but then it's also this notion of think into other boxes. So one of the, the tools that we have in futurism is you do this sort of cross-impact analysis, where you take a bunch of things and you're not separate it. By the way, I will provide a PDF of the whole slide deck. So if you want to capture any of this, you're going to have it. Okay, so it is to take these four quadrants and then add things to it. Social media, money, augmentation, aging. By the way, that actually is a photograph of Cher. How she's supposed to look. I think, I think someone took a photograph of the photograph that's in her attic, um, the portrait. How do those things affect each other? Don't, don't have your world in isolation. There are no boundaries. Or how about youth culture and nanotechnology and automation and energy? Or an architect versus a virtual architect, and 3D printers, an artist. Or maker culture, an appropriate housing. I had, I had affordable housing and I went, nope, appropriate I think is better. Entrepreneurism, citizen architect. They all talk, they all come together. Again, let's bring back the most valuable resource is your attention. But I suspect that many of you are afflicted with ADOS. Do you know what ADOS is? A-D-O-S, attention deficit, ooh, shiny! <laughs> Think about our relationship to these things. We cradle them, we gaze into them, we stroke them. There's just two words missing from this conversation. <laughs> My precious. <laughs> Nasty baggages. Multitasking. How many of you are good at multitasking? How many of you are afraid to raise your hand in front of me anymore? <laughs> yeah, I know it's misspelled, but I was driving here and I didn't get a chance to, you know, <laughs> fix it, get off my case. So here's the thing. So Clifford, uh, Nicholas Carr wrote the book, The Shallows, and in there, there's this little passage. Intensive multitaskers are suckers for irrelevancy, says Clifford Nass, one of the professors who did the research. Everything distracts them. Messernick often an even bleaker assessment is you multitask online, we are training our brains to pay attention to the crap. Let me repeat that, crap. What are we doing to ourselves? We are training ourselves to have the attention span of a dog. Poop, poop. I, was on a, I was on a program up in um, Portland last year. Cognitive scientist was on the program, and he talked about in the time of our grandparents, the average person could pay attention to something singularly for upwards of 20 minutes. He says today it's down to about nine seconds. In terms of evolution, this is we're doing it wrong. We need silence, calm, repose. We need a day of rest to not have these things, to just be present. Everyone says you always have to have an open mind. 
G.K. Chesterton said the purpose of an open mind is like that of an open mouth. It is to close it on something solid. If you cannot close your mind, you cannot make a decision. And we have some decisions to make. Not about everything, but about some important things. The conclusion is very simple. It is about hope, and you must have hope. It's one of the most powerful forces in the world. It's not optimism. Optimism is about things going your way. Hope has great paradoxical power that hope is most powerful when things are hopeless and you fight the hopeless battle and still hope to win. There's an English writer by the name of Eden Philpotts. He says, the universe is full of magical things patiently waiting for our wits to grow sharper. The universe is full of magical things patiently waiting for our wits to grow sharper. That is a manifesto. That is a design manifesto. It is a, it is a manifesto for anybody who wants to be an architect or in the broader world of design. You can look anywhere and you can see magical things. The fact that we're in a building and this stays up. Do you understand your magicians? This is magical. It really is. And if you don't see it that way, if you haven't retained some of the childlike wonder about all the things we can do and the power that you have to be imaginative, to do magical things, it requires humility. But it also requires this amazing look into the world and, get, and say, I got a chance to do this. I am grateful and I am hopeful. And you are architects. Thank you. Thank you.